Good evening, good morning. So today I'll be speaking about femoral shaft fractures. Femoral shaft fractures. This is a femoral fracture is the most common injury due to high velocity trauma. It occurs in one in ten thousand people. So it most commonly occurs in active patients like uh, less than twenty-five years or osteoporotic patients where 65 years are number. Most common is RTA, road traffic accidents. So location of the fractures, it can occur anywhere in the femur, upper middle or lower one third. So there are three displacements of the proximal fragment. So you can see the proximal fragment goes to abduction, external rotation or uh, flexion. These are the three deformities present in the proximal fragment. Whereas the proximal uh, distal fragment goes to adduction deformity, adduction deformity, and uh, as well as proximal migration due to the pull of the muscles. So there are clinical features. Uh, we should ask for a history. Usually, there is a history of severe violence or trauma. The signs of the Fractures like a uh, pain, swelling, deformity, and ab abnormal mobility will be present. So, you should uh, you can uh, assess the patient by the history and the uh, signs. And our diagnosis X ray is the gold standard. X ray is usually taken with one joint above and uh, below, it's taken along with the pelvis so that we don't miss any pelvis fractures which are usually associated. So, coming to the flat classification. AO classification of femur diaphysis fractures. This is AO classification. A1, A2, A3. Based on the type of the fracture. It is a simple fracture. It is called A1. A, A type of fractures. And uh, complex as the complexity increases, it will be uh, uh, like uh, B and C groups. So depending on that, A1, A2, A3, B2, B1, B2, B3, and B, C1, C2, C3 means, uh, means the most complex variety of fractures, where it is comminuted a lot, and A1 is a simple fracture. Another type of classification is uh, given by Winkfish and Hansen. Uh, there are five types. Based on combination, if there is no combination, it is type 0. Type 1 fracture, in severe butterfly fragment is present with transverse or short oblique fracture. In type 2, there is a large butterfly. This is the butterfly fragment. There is a large butterfly fragment, uh, but it's a less than 50% of the bone width. If, the, if it is larger than, uh, if it is having uh, less than 50% of contact, it is type 3 fracture. And type 4 is the most severe one with a large combination present. So, femur fracture management. It is a high velocity injury. So, we should stabilize the fracture as soon as we see the patient. So, initially, we put, in, put him on a, put the patient on a portable traction splint. And after that, we can put a transverse splint and balance. I'll tell you in detail about it. So initially we put them on a traction and stabilize the patient. After the after stabilizing, we should always check the vitals because there is a lot of you know, blood loss for the upper bone, uh, long bone fractures, femur and the pelvis and the tibia also. So whenever we see the patient, we should stabilize the fracture and put him on a splint or traction. After that, there are, uh, after the patient is evaluated then we can put him on skin skin traction or pin traction so you uh, this this is decided based on the age of the patient and uh, whether he wants surgery and uh, whether he's fit for surgery or not if it is not if he is not fit for surgery we should we usually treat him by conservative methods so this is the skin traction where we apply a pre bandage and uh, put a traction uh, to the leg so that the so that the femur 
it uh, falls in alignment and uh, slowly yeah. over a period of three weeks uh, fracture will be right for uh, adults some more uh, a greater amount of traction is required so usually we put a pin upper tibial pin and uh, uh, to that we apply load it is called as pin traction in children uh, usually they they have a good healing property and uh, so we usually apply plaster of paris and this is a hip spiker usually we apply for children and uh, some young adults this is called a one and a half hip spiker cast so if there is a fracture in this femur we usually apply full leg cast out until to, to, to here and the opposite leg, leg we apply a half cast so it is called one and a half hip spiker spiker means whenever we apply about around the trunk or uh, so it is called a spiker and this is abduction maintaining rod sprint so this is called one and a half spiker cast usually apply it for children other methods so and those are the conservative methods now these i'll talk about the operative methods so this is the flexible intramedullar nail also called as tens nail where we apply nails intramedullary under cm guidance these are also used for children because for adults the muscle forces are large and we and these are not sufficient to hold the fracture fragments so this is the fracture and we usually apply tens nail we usually pass a tens nail from this end a lower end of the femur from medial and lateral aspect medial and lateral aspect on the cm guidance the fracture is aligned and uh, so fracture is aligned and it is fixed slowly as you can see or a period of time or usually of three three weeks or six weeks the callus is formed and fracture is united and uh, we can remove it at a later stage if you want for adults the tens nails are not sufficient so usually we perform the interlocking nailing this is the preferred method the where the medullary can medullary canal is reamed with reamers under cm guidance so this is the intramedullary nail just a illustration uh, where the canal is intramedullary canal is reamed and uh, the i am nail is passed intramedullary nail uh, modification later the reason modification is we put interlocking screws and the upper and lower end lower ends so it is called interlocking intramedullary nail so this is a one type of nailing is one type of treatment operative treatment and the plating is another type of treatment where we apply the plate and apply screws so that the fracture is stabilized so these are different types of femur nailing if we put the nail from the anti grade and apply interlocking screws these are the pro screws it is called intramedullary interlocking nail this is another variety where the screw is oblique and this is called a pond nail or pier nail and this is a retrograde nail where the nail is passed from the knee joint so this is anti grade nailing and this is retrograde nailing so the main complications of a femur fracture as i told you shock is the first uh, thing we should get thing uh, take care usually there is a 1 liter to 1.5 liter blood loss so immediately we should uh, as soon as we see the patient we should stabilize the patient and start him on iv fluids and after that uh, shock is the most common complication fat embolism it usually occurs within 24 to 48 hours next the injury to the femoral artery and sciatic nerves vascular injuries usually occur because of the sharp fragments they pierce through the soft tissues and injure the arteries or nerves surrounding the fracture so usually we apply a traction or splint and the next is a surgery after surgery there will be usually hard hardware failure like the implants will break down so the fracture will get uh, 
will not be able to unite. This is a mechanical failure. And uh, next, after surgery, uh, usually we find non-union in less than one to two percent. Non-union, malunion, delayed union. They'll be they'll dealt with the another class in detail. So non-union is uh, seen in one to two percent of the patient. Malunion, there is a shortening, as I told you, that, uh, due, due to the pull of the vectors muscles. There'll be malunion and shortening. Next, infection is the another common cause, usually seen in compound fractures. So while so doing surgery, we usually clean it and uh, then apply the nailing. And uh, last is a knee stiffness. Usually we find the stiffness because in retrograde nailing, we, we, we enter to the knee joint and it causes knee stiffness. Or else in anti-grain nailing also, we find knee stiffness because of delayed uh, long-term immobility of the joint. So that is the that is regarding the femur fractures. Next, I'll talk about the patella fractures. As you know, patella is the largest sphoid bone in the body. There, there is a two facet joints, medial and lateral facet joint, and uh, separated by the longitudinal ridge. The distal pole over there is uh, non-articular. Whereas these two uh, basic joints are, these are articular. So main point is, this is the largest sesamoid bone of the body, sesamoid bone in the body, and is useful for the extension aspect of the knee. So whenever they, we find a fracture of the patella, usually patient complains of pain and swelling of the knee joint. You can find abrasions, contusions, lacerations, or something. Uh, signs of injury, all the signs of injury. And uh, that usually patient, we usually miss it because of the more bigger fractures, like a femur or tibia. The petal also should be taken care. So, so whenever we find uh, lacerations or something, we can just check, take an X-ray and check whether there is any petal or injury. So on palpation also, we, we find a lot of uh, tenderness. Apart from tenderness, we find a defect. Because the petal, once it gets uh, fractured, the fragments get apart. And uh, it will be uh, well uh, visible. I mean, it, it can be felt by a defect in the uh, petal side. So as I told you, there is uh, petal is very important in extension of the knee. So one can uh, ask them to perform straight leg raised and if there is no extension lag patella injury is uh, can be ruled out but gold standard is take an x-ray so x-ray usually ap lateral or views are enough but sometimes we take a special view actual view or patella uh, views so as you can see this is the patella and it got fractured this is a distal fragment which got uh, displaced and is a proximal fragment which got migrated up due to the pull of the extensor aspect of it. So always check the petala plate, whether it is a baja, baja or alta. Baja means petala, baja means uh, it, uh, it's high above. So fracture, not the fracture pattern. If there is any articular step up, it is a uh, we can suspect uh, on palpation. So the special views are patellar view and uh, actual view, sunrise views. So you can take a uh, next in investigation of choices, apart from X-ray, CT scan is important. Some hairline fractures or occult fractures can be found out only on CT scan. So in the classification, there are different types of fractures. If it is the fracture across uh, the fragment, it is called a transfer fracture, whereas this is called a vertical fracture, longitudinal fracture. And if it is more than two or two inches, it is called a comminuted fracture. So these are the different types. transfers, marginal, occurs a fracture occurs over a margin, it is called marginal, vertical, comminuted. Osteochondral fracture is it, it will have a piece of the bone. 
avulsion is just uh, the fracture is due to the pull of the muscles a piece of the bone get fractured so those are the types of fracture as i told you some fractures are uh, undisplaced or minimally displaced for a uh, for those type of fractures we usually prefer non operative treatment and non operative treatment means it is applying a bit above it aboni casing plaster of paris casing so we uh, we prefer non non operative treatment when there is less than 2 mm articular step up okay so uh, with main there is extensor as extensor mechanism should be intact so the extensor reticulum if it is intact the extension of the knee will be possible and th for those we can uh, treat with non operative treatment and uh, for low demand for patients who are elderly and who don't do uh, physical activity much we can consider minimal for minimally displaced fractures we can consider non operative treatment as uh, usually if the patient is not fit for surgery also we can consider non operative treatment so the non operative treatment is long leg cylindric cast it is about from the top about knee to the distal foot till the foot we apply a plaster of paris facing cylindric cast and the weight bearing as uh, the patient is tolerated we can start on weight bearing rehabilitation protocol everything after 3 3 weeks to 6 weeks we can decide whether the fracture is united or not and then we can start him on a range of motion exercises so that we do patient doesn't develop uh, knee stiffness next uh, the operative treatment so the main goal is preservation of extensor function of the knee that is the main goal of the patella fracture treatment apart from that as i told you in the first slide there are two articular facets so we should uh, maintain the articular congruity or else it will damage the knee and uh, it will lead to knee osteoarthritis patellar femoral arthritis osteoarthritis so there are different approaches and this is the main most commonly used approach of mid long longitudinal midline incision uh, we do in the knee apart from that uh, some other incisions are there it is not need for you so operative techniques by uh, we reduce the fracture and then we apply ki wires with tension band wiring i'll show you the pictures later other methods are cannulator la lag screw fixation cannulator lag screw with tpw part partial patella we told like these are the different operative treatments i'll tell you in detail about each so this is called tension band wiring where we pass the uh, we first we reduce the fracture once we finish the exposure everything we reduce the fracture this is the fracture line the fracture is reduced and then we pass two k wires vertically perpendicular to the fracture for side and then we take an uh, ss wire and uh, wind it in a figure of eight and then we do medial and lateral tightening so the compression it will compress the fracture so this is the it is called tension and wiring because the wire is kept under tension is tensioning is done to the wire it is called tension band wiring so as i told you the wire converts anterior distractive forces to compressive forces on the articular surface so this is the mechanism the pictures once we do tensioning the fracture will come together complete uh, on complete run and tensioning the fracture is reduced nicely so next is lag screw fixation this is the fracture in the middle the lag screw is passed so this is the red line is the fracture we usually fix the perpendicular to the fracture side the fragment is fixed and another circular wire is called fixed so that the, this fracture is reduced so in the main principle is lag screw fixation this is the screw and it is fix, fixing the fragments it is called lag screw fixation 
and this is another variety of uh, large through fixation. This is the petal lung. As you can see the lateral view, this is a petal lung. Large throughs are applied perpendicular branches right. Another examples. And this is called cannulatal lateral screw with tension band wire, where we apply both the principles like uh, instead of the K where we apply lag screws and within the cannulated lag screw the wire is passed and it is same applied as a figure of H shape and tension. In cases uh, where the fracture fragments are very small on one hole we remove the we can't reconstruct all the fragments so in that cases we do a partial petal acting. so all the small uh, fractures which are extensive combination or are not amenable to fixation so larger fragments we can uh, repair them with screws and uh, uh, preserve the cartilage but small fragments cannot be uh, repaired so it can be it is best to avoid uh, excise them it is called partial petalectomy when the complete petala is damaged uh, severely comminuted we should uh, go for a total petalectomy whether partial petalectomy or total petalectomy we should uh, repair the surrounding muscles extensor aspect of the knee so the patient will have a little defect in extension if we don't repair so there will be complete uh, extensor lag So that is called a total petalectomy. Partial and total petalectomy can be done only when it is not possible to repair the fragments. Post-operative management, usually we immobilize with an knee brace and uh, after the fracture is united, we can slowly start. Early range of motion is uh, advised because of the with tension band wearing the, as soon as uh, advantage is uh, we are starting on early weight bearing so the complications knee stiffness is most common because the it is uh, near the knee joint and whenever it is uh, towards the knee joint uh, towards any joint we should start on early immobilization or else we'll still have knee stiffness and infection is known complication for any type of surgery loss of fixation it's common because the fragments are very soft bone and the wires can pull through on weight bearing. Osteoarthritis is a late complication because it results from articular da damage. And non-union is very rare it's because it is a, it's a small bone and usually 1% will have that. And if the hardware pierces to the skin or it irritates on the skin, it will be causing pain, so it is called painful hardware. So the six complications. Non as you see, as I told you, non-union, the fracture is uh, not united even after a period of nine months. So it is called non-union. Loss of fixation when the uh, uh, fragments, uh, the implant hardware uh, breaks through. The, this wire and the SS wire, K wires and SS wire, they, they got broken. So it is called loss of fixation. Mal union, if it is uh, fracture is united in a deformed position. So this the articular surface, and uh, see uh, there is a step, and later the fracture is gone, uh, gone displaced. So it is called mal, mal united, the fracture. So that is about the petal of fractures. Now uh, fractures around the knee, usually. Uh, we start with the distal femur, lower end of the femur. It is called a distal femur fractures. This area, uh, distal femur fractures. So, distal femur, it is a normal valgus shear uh, in origin. So, as you can see, this is 81 degrees and 99 degrees on the medial. So, the knee, normal knee joint alignment is in a little bit of valgus. So distal femur includes both the supracondylar and condylar regions. Supracondylar region of the femur is a zone within the femur condyles and the junction of metaphysis. So the 10 to 15 centimeters of the distal femur it is called supracondylar and uh, condylar regions. Distal femur fractures are also common, but uh, it is only account, accounts for only 7% of the total femur fractures. 
whenever a fracture is there, clean care validation is common and unable to emulate due to the pain, swelling, usually history of injury, and uh, usually for all the trauma cases, you know, clinical evaluation points will be same. Pain, swelling, deformity, everything. Whenever uh, you find any fracture patient, it's a must to assess the neurovascular status. If there is any vascular injury or nerve injury, we should document it so that we can treat at a later stage. If vascular injury is there, we should assess it uh, and uh, treat immediately so that we may try to save the limb. So if there is a tense swelling in the popliteal area, we should uh, suspect injury to the popliteal artery. That's why we should check the pulse, distal, pulse at the distal end of the uh, foot. So if there is any signs of pallor and lack of pulse, it usually suggests a major vessel injury like the popliteal artery. So to diagnose it, radiographic evaluation, x-rays are taken in AP lateral views and uh, uh, 45 degrees oblique views of, of the distal radius. The distal femur can be taken, but uh, the best uh, uh, investigation of choice is the CT scan because the complex intraarticular fractures uh, and everything will be visible on it. And uh, the CT scan with 3D reconstruction is very useful because we can uh, assess the fracture fragments and it will be helpful for operative planning. As I told you, the fracture, we should take the entire femur x-rays. Apart from CT, we can take an MRI to assess the ligaments and the meniscal injuries. So the classification of the meniscal femur fractures again the AO, AO classification, AO Muller classification. And these are the types of uh, extra articular fractures, and uh, next the partial articular fractures and complete type C is a uh, complete articular. So type A extra articular outside the joint, all the fractures will be. Type A is simple, type 2, type A2 is uh, some bit complex and type 3 is the most uh, severe variety, it's combinated. So type A is extra articular, type B is partial articular, only one articular surface is involved, involved. and type C is complete articular surface, bicondylar. The two, two condyles are involved. And based on the severity of the combination, that is called one, two, three. The treatment usually uh, non-operative treatment for distal femur fractures is not advisable because it is the articular surface which is involved. But uh, some patients, if a uh, patient is not fit for surgery, then usually we suggest uh, non-operative treatment. That's what we discussed. Everything if you can send surgeon practice, patient practice. Operative treatment, all the distal famous are best treated by operative stabilization. And uh, this, it should be done within six, uh, eight hours. In the meantime, we can apply the tibial traction pin so that the uh, articular surface is maintained. So the different uh, treatment options, these are all the surgery, different surgical treatments, angle, blade, plate, and corner. I'll tell you of each and every with examples. This is a 95 degrees angle blade plate. It's a 95 degrees blade plate. We usually reduce the fracture and apply the, under CM guidance, we apply the uh, plate and uh, along with the screws. This is called a 95 degrees angle blade plate. Uh, next variety is a dynamic condylar screw, DCS. This is called a dynamic condylar screw. Same principle, the plate is applied, and the screws are applied. DCS, uh, DCS screw will uh, produce compression at the practice side. This is other variety. So you can see this is a DCS. Next, a uh, condylar buttress plate. For more severe fractures, L plate or DCS is used. But uh, disadvantage is it lacks uh, strength. And uh, depending on the uh, severity of the fracture, we can apply it to a double plating. Uh, where we, our, our aim is to go to the articular surface. 
next variety is uh, intramedullary femoral nails. Will be usually applied with the retrograde as I told you in the femur fractures. Uh, retrograde, we pass the nail after uh, reducing the fracture. So this is a retrograde nail and uh, reduce the fracture. It is a type A1 fracture, extra articular, simple fracture. We reduce the fracture and uh, pass the nail retrograde. And uh, this are called inter interlocking screws. It is called an intermedullary nail, supracondylar nail. And lastly, the uh, plate plating. It's a list plate, less invasive skeletal stabilization. It's a minimal, uh, minimal invasive technique, and we pass the plate subcutaneously and fix the fracture with screw, plate and screws. So, the fracture complications. Usually, the fixture, fixation failure will be there because of patient factors or bones, or bone quality, uh, or some surgical planning issue. So, fixation failure, all the hardware failure also comes into the fixation failure. Malunion is common because uh, it is intraarticular and uh, unstable fixation may result in malunion. For a period of time, the fractures, fragments get displaced and it will cause malunion. So, in malunion, virus is the most common deformity. Non union is very rare because it is a cancerous bone and uh, it has a rich, rich uh, vascular supply. So, non union is rare, but you should make a note of it. Osteoarthritis is most common because it is the articular surface which is involved and it will cause damage to the articular concrete. So, osteoarthritis. And knee stuckness is a known complication. Next, we have the tibial fracture fractures. Tibial plateau is the upper end of the tibia. It is formed by the medial and lateral tibial condyles, which articulate with the distal end of the femur. So this is the tibial plateau. The articular surface of the medial side is a little con concave. It is a lateral side is a little bit con convex. That's the main point. So the mechanism of injury usually occurs due to the valgus force. Valgus force is most common for the lateral tibial plateau fractures and is often associated with the middle collateral ligament injuries. So there is a high energy trauma. Actual loading causes uh, middle condylar and bicondylar fracture fracture. So there, uh, there is a classification called a Sajskar classification. It is of six types. The type one is split displaced fracture of the lateral condyle. This is the fracture one. And there is a split and displacement of the uh, undisplaced split. Only split is there, but uh, less undisplaced, undisplaced. Only the fracture of the lateral condyle is there. It is, if it is a called a lateral condyle, split fracture is type one. Type 2 is also of the lateral condyle, but there is a depression. See, the fracture is uh, depressed. So, it is called a split depressed. First one is slipped undisplaced. It is an undisplaced fracture of the lateral condyle. If there is a depression, it is called type 2. Split depression. And type 3 is only depression is there. There is no split. Of the lateral condyle. Type 4 fracture is of the medial condyle, whether a split or depression. It is a type 5 is a bicondylar fracture, and type 6 uh, rest of the fractures with a metaphysical involvement. So it is of six types as per classification. We should make a note of these soft tissue injuries, whether there is any meniscus injuries. Cruciate ligaments, ACL, PCL, collateral ligaments, MCL, LCL, medial collateral, lateral collateral. Out of them, ACL, out of the crucial injury, uh, cruciate ligament injuries, ACL injury is most common. And out of the collateral, MCL and MCL, LCL, MCL is most common. And, uh, skin and surrounding soft tissue injuries may be noted because if it is a compound fracture, we should treat the skin initially. After that only, we can fix the fracture. 
so the clean fracture are routine pain swelling hematrosis because the knee joint the accumulated blood will go into the joint cause swelling hematrosis pain swelling tenderness and restriction movement these are all the usual which is of a uh, fracture so for the diagnosis we need an x-ray and uh, ap and lateral views are usually sufficient and a 3d 3d ct helps in uh, evaluation of the degree of depression and the fracture configuration everything we can assess so mri is also helpful because uh, there is a lot of uh, soft tissue uh, injuries will be there all the menisci cruciate cruciate collaterals everything will be visible only on mri so for the distal femur fractures and uh, proximal tibia fractures these three types of uh, investigations are very useful so the treatment uh, plan as usual if it is undisplaced uh, if it is undisplaced we usually apply a plaster we usually apply a little bit above but the uh, minimally displaced uh, tibial plateau fractures for the uh, treatment of uh, minimally displaced or undisplaced uh, articular surface we should check the articular surface if the articular surface is uh, congruent uh, we should, we could uh, try uh, non operative methods but uh, usually there will be a split or depression and for them we should reduce the fracture and then apply a screw or plate these are the only two options available so different types of uh, plates will be there and this is the if there is a skin injury surrounding skin uh, skin is injured we usually apply a external fixator so in bicondylar fractures and type 6 more uh, bicondylar type 6 fractures more rigorous fixation is to be done so soft tissue injury is associated and that's why we apply a uh, excel fixator so that is about the tibial plateau fractures next uh, injuries in the, around the knee which comprises of the acl pcl injuries so Uh, ligamentous injuries uh, should be taken uh, care of and apart from them the meniscus injuries will be there acl injuries i'll be uh, talk about that acl is a anterior cruciate ligament it is uh, it accounts for uh, half of the ligamentous injuries of the knee so once we tell about the ligament injury of the knee we should primarily suspect about acl and then we should think about a pcl mcl everything and it occurs uh, in highly active sports persons 70% of the patients are from sporting activity and most commonly it is uh, common in the females because so the the uh, examination usually they usually come a bit late it's not an acute injury so we should check the uh, different uh, examination techniques so there is a latchment test where we catch out uh, pull the uh, tibia anteriorly while supporting the femur where the patient uh, knee is bent 30 degrees and uh, there we pull the, uh, the tibia anteriorly and check for the movement of the uh, knee joint so it is called a latchment test and uh, other test is uh, anti drawer test another examination te- technique is pivot shift test uh, positive test is uh, pathognomic pathognomic and uh, we check the rotational component also for ligament inj- injuries the x ray is not useful only it could be visible on an mri scan mri scan this is the normal acl thick black structure where as you can see this is a injured acl as it all patients will not come immediately so we can't uh, there's a lot of fibrous tissue and that's why it uh, we can't see a normal acl 
it is place. It's a torn issue. So, imagine uh, investigation of choice for the ligamentous injuries is MRI. So, the ACL treatment protocol, if there is an ACL rupture, uh, diagnosed on MRI, we should check for uh, MCL or LCL injuries, and uh, meniscus injuries, everything. If there are anything, we initially re reconstruct the ACL, and uh, then if we racial reconstruction is done. If there is no associated injuries, then we should assess the patient activity level. If it is a competitive person, then definitely ACL reconstruction is done. Or else if it's not, uh, we could try different types of, based on activity level. We could try, uh, try non-operative methods for uh, less sedentary or light non-operative methods. Usually they heal sometimes. So the non-operative treatment is usually suggested for uh, less active persons. So the primary goal in such patients is we should uh, uh, get a functional stability of the knee. The knee should be stable. So patient, whenever the patient walks, he should not be uh, feeling any instability or feeling of giving away of the knee. For that, uh, we usually do non-operative treatment and uh, put on a physiotherapy. These are the different types of physiotherapy protocols, open chain hamstrings and exercises and close chain quadriceps exercises. Apart from braces, we use uh, uh, prophylactically or rehabilitative purpose. So the main goal is to turn the functional stability of the knee and prevent further injury. So ACL reconstruction, uh, it is an arthroscopic procedure. Uh, we do it in an arthroscopic method. We take a graft from the same person or a different person. It is called same person graft is autograft or allograft is from other person. So uh, these are the complications, um, the loss of the graft strength and everything. So different types of uh, ACL reconstruction is a bone, bone patella bone graft. Graft is taken from the patella bone, patella tendon. And I'll uh, show you the pictures later. And uh, another type is quadriceps graft. Is another is uh, hamstring graft is taken and it is quadruple. So these three types of uh, grafts are there. bone tendon, bone patella bone is a one type of one. Hamstring is the next common. And quadriceps is a recent method. So, as I told you, there is a bone patella bone grafting, and this is a hamstring graft. These are all Allo graft is taken from another person, and uh, as exposure, if the patient is not able to give a graft, or if he if he used it for a previous surgery, you can't take it from the same person. This is the graft harvesting technique, uh, bone, patella, bone. This is the patella bone, and uh, this is the patella tendon. We take uh, the bone, patella, and bone. This is the graft, PTB graft. And this is the surgical technique. We drill the hole from the tibial canal. This is the tibial canal preparation. We drill a hole, and then arthroscopically, the canal, uh, tibial tunnel is prepared. And this is the canal is uh, reamed, and there we can see the reamer. After that, uh, this is the femur canal is uh, prepared, and then the graft is passed through the canal, and it is fixed. This is the steps. We fix uh, the graft with the different types of uh, screws, and it, everything is done arthroscopically. So the ACL complications. The early reconstruction is uh, better for sporting persons to allow them to return to sports early. Early reconstruction is done. If we don't uh, do it early, then it will cause uh, damage to the articular cartilage and uh, it will uh, lead to arthritic changes. Arthritic changes. 
other complications are intraoperative complications like petal fracture will occur or vascular injuries may occur. These are all the different uh, surgery related complications. In post operative, if there are uh, rehabilitation is not uh, good, we have motion deficit and uh, decrease range of motion, and then some residual knee pain will be there. Next, uh, PCL injuries are the next topic. Isolated PCL injuries is a rare condition. Usually it is associated with other knee injuries. PCL injuries usually occur due to dashboard injuries. This is a dashboard injury where the injury pushes the tibia posteriorly, causing injury to the ligament. This is a PCL rupture with, uh, due to um, dashboard injuries. Or else there's a hyperfection with a plantar. So this is another type of injury. So you can see the PCL rupture over here. It is called a hypertension, hyperextension injury. So examination of the PCL injuries, it's a posterior droidus. For the ACL, it is called anterior drawer test. It is called for this one posterior drawer test. The procedure is catch hold of the tibia and uh, push it posteriorly so that uh, the, they will be giving it away of the PCL. So the PCL, uh, the knee will move backwards. It is called a posterior sac. So usual X-rays, uh, X-rays, uh, normal X-rays will not be sufficient. We'll take a stress X-ray means uh, we'll push it uh, posteriorly and then take an x-ray. So we can see the degree of mo movement and then decide roughly whether there is any injury of the PCL. But uh, for a soft tissue injury, MRI is the standard of a diagnosis. MRI scan is done for the knee joint for uh, any PCL injury. So usually two methods of treatment, non-operative and operative. So, if the, based on the posterior draw test, if there's less than 10 degrees, uh, 10 mm movement, we usually suggest a non operative treatment. After the uh, period of six weeks, uh, after the period of uh, on, uh, facing, I applied, early rehabilitation is a uh, physiotherapy should be kept. So, for this, the rehabilitation with the success for the early recovery. And uh, injuries of the knee, always uh, we should check for the degenerative diseases like uh, osteoarthritis and all. Operative treatment, arthroscopic, uh, same arthrograph, telegraph, uh, all the tunnels uh, positions will be changing. And uh, if other, uh, that is about the reconstruction. In some fractures, uh, there is an avulsion of the bone. Avulsion of the bone will be usually be. Uh, fix uh, the frag fragment with a screw. So different types of, uh, but this, this is the PCL avulsion injuries treatment. If there is a large fragment of avulsion, usually fracture, uh, fix it by the screw, open reduction and internal fixation of the fracture fragment. If it is a small fragment, based on a, uh, translation we decide whether it is a uh, reconstruction is done or uh, to be done or uh, simple physiotherapy will be enough that's about the ligament injuries and uh, I'm not uh, these are uh, last topic is meniscal injuries the, there are two meniscus medial and lateral meniscus so the meniscus is a fibrocartilaginous space space of fusion between two inherent free non-congress articular surfaces so this is the arthroscopic view this is the ligament um, meniscus you can see the meniscus is uh, not torn and uh, this is a complete meniscus normal meniscus if it is torn it will be visible on arthroscope like this a wavy pattern so there are two meniscus Medial and lateral meniscus. So, meniscus function 
to absorb most of the shock waves generated by the impulse rolling of the knee during normal gait. So it, its main function is to absorb the shock waves. Inability of the shock, uh, to absorb the shock waves it will lead to early damage of the articular cartilage. So if, we, if the meniscus uh, damages at any point of life, there will be early osteoarthritic changes. So the meniscus repair. Uh, there are two varieties of treatment, meniscus repair and uh, meniscus removal. It's called meniscectomy. So repair is done whenever there is a tear in the peripheral red zone. Periphery in the uh, periphery, if there is any tear, then the, uh, the healing potential will be more. In those conditions only we do a repair. Repair means just suturing. It can be done by suturing or uh, by absorbable arrows or augmentation techniques. These are all uh, so the suturing is done with uh, absorbable sutures like vital or non absorbable sutures like the bone or synthetic like coral ring. These are different types of uh, techniques of suturing. Uh, we should have the knot outside the capsule so that it will not uh, irritate the joint cartilage due to uh, damage, further damage. So, so on minister uh, suturing, it heals with fibrous uh, cartilage, fibrovascular uh, scar tissue within 10 weeks of time. And uh, this scar tissue remodels over a period of uh, months to years. But uh, whatever uh, healing this is inferior to the natural uh, shoe which uh, is present. Three to four months, this healed tissue is mechanically inferior to the normal tissue. So the, there's a classification the, for the meniscus tears. Vertical tears, uh, horizontal tears, complex tears, bucket handle tears. So different varieties of tears will be there. So these are different types. Peripheral tears, as I told you, is a periphery rim where is the vascular supply is good. This are the, that's why it's called a red, red zone tears. Central tears, uh, there's not much vascular supply. So it is called a vascular, a vascular zone. So it is called a central zone tears, peripheral and central. And the uh, rest are the, based on the transverse or horizontal vertical, based on the shape. It is called the transportation system. Meniscus tears, if it is not uh, repairable, it is advisable to remove the meniscus. <coughs> meniscus uh, removal is called meniscectomy. Based on the piece, amount of the meniscus they remove, it is called a partial or complete meniscectomy. It is, uh, as I told it, it, it absorbs a lot of shock waves. So it is advisable to remove, remove as little as possible and preserve as, as best as possible. Meniscus repair usually done with uh, associated ligament injuries. We repair the ACL, PCL at that time, we repair the meniscus repair uh, injuries also. So, okay. So, the take home points on the fractures. For the distal femur, uh, take home messages. We should uh, diagnose the fractures. Uh, and uh, for femur fractures, we should be vigilant to take the blood loss into account. Immediately, we should stabilize the fracture and uh, replenish with uh, all the blood loss. Usually, there is a uh, thousand to fifteen hundred ml blood loss. We can diagnose with an X-ray and uh, take a CT scan for the articular fragments, articular joint uh, fragment uh, fractures. MRI scan is done for ligamentous injuries. Now, uh, if we see children, the treatment modalities are different. For uh, 
children, we can try conservative methods. Or for patients who are not fit for surgery, we can try some. We can do conservative methods. If a patient is fit for uh, surgery, we usually prefer operative methods. Operative methods are uh, we can get uh, we can get good results and early mob uh, mobility of the patient. If any doubts are there, you can message.